Hello, everyone. My name is Seng Han Baek, an assistant professor at the Department of Architecture in Busan National University, located in Busan, South Korea. The title of my talk today is Teaching Architectural Complexity via Plastics. So I will open my presentation slides and read my manuscript uh, that I have prepared. So here is the slide. Okay, so in my presentation today, I will explore architectural complexity by bringing one specific point, which is plastic. In doing so, I like to divide, divide my talk into two parts. The first is about a new material called plastic glomerate. It is a mesmerizing and uncanny object, but in fact, no more than a waste. It evades any normative categorizations so that trying to understand it will confront problems that are not easily resolved in both aesthetically and ethically. I had a discussion session during the class entitled Contemporary Korean Architecture. By taking plastic glomerate as a platform to read other ways of making relationship with the material, I will elaborate some of the main points mentioned in the class through which to explore architectural complexity, which cannot fully be approached through empirical data or plastics. This way of thinking encourages us to rethink a set of cliched binaries such as nature and culture, local and global, good and bad, and beautiful and ugly, instead of focusing on their modes of entanglement. The second part is to explore what I mean by complexity by investigating a recent environmental friendly public project located in Seoul, which is a playground made of wasted cell phones. What makes this case worth noticing is its indistinctiveness, which is supposed to be a symbolic monument made by recycled materials but having no strong connotations of environmental moralism. This nuanced reading will encourage to think about the open relationship between architecture and plastic, also offering another way of thinking about architecture in the Anthropocene from the ground. Okay, as to the first part, I'll raise the following question for class discussion. What would be the implications of plastic glomerate? when it comes to the architecture in the age of climate change. This question was followed with the image, or actually a, the set of images about an object that Patrick Kokora and Kelly Jasbeck found in 2012 at Camino Beach of Hawaii. For example, this is an object mixed with a few different things. A cigarette lighter is one uh, that you can clearly see uh, at its center, but it is also fused with uh, fragmented rocks, sand, and tiny dust. Those things are glued together so that it is almost impossible to put them apart. It is naturally formed, although its, its sources are multiple. Tight would be one force making this out, whereas Floating, floating trusses near the beach would be another. This kind of thing looks mesmerizing, but one may also find it appalling when starting to think about how its microplastic fragments could come back to us through air and water pipe. It is an object that one may find interesting in terms of its aesthetics, but he or she would realize that it is supposed to ultimately affect my body in one way or another. This new material represents how our planet is filled with wasted things. And looking at this kind of material instigates our moralism to do something immediately. One of, one of the popular reactions that students raised about this image is to see it as a clear sign of climate crisis. Along this line of thought, plastic glomerate is considered an alarming object, reminding us 
of the larger environmental issues such as global warming, the inefficiency of recycling, and the production system of plastics to, ju to just name a few. We are the one that makes worse the planet, but not attentive enough as to how to improve the impending environmental problems. Ideas about using less amounts of plastics and coming up with ways of improving the system of recycling were suggested. In addition, references to some recent and ongoing cases that architects and artists upcycle up wasted plastics for their own work were also introduced. Using wood for construction was suggested as an alternative, which could, uh, which could lessen carbon emission when compared to more popular architectural materials such as concrete, steel, and glass. Meanwhile, there were also comments that plastic glomerate illustrates a strange convergence of different things, one derived from nature and another from culture. Even there was an opinion that confronting with this kind of material makes it difficult to make proper aesthetic or ethical judgment because it is an unprecedented phenomenon that is not clearly categorized under any pre-existing norms and criteria. <laughs> what I like to draw from the discussion is the situatedness that everyone is always already deeply entangled with the plastic world. It is fair to criticize that our world is permeated by wasted plastics, which make our environment deteriorated. In this respect, sharing the images of plastic glomerate could generate a consensus that we need immediate action to reduce those wastes and make the environment clean and sustainable. This line of thought is based on um, what, what is called environmental moralism, which, however, does not pay enough attention to the effectivity of waste. In the book entitled The Ethics of Waste, cultural critic Gay Hawkins develops an idea that waste is something that we need to deal with practically and ethically. But the ethics that she refers to is different from morality. Hawkins explains that, quote, Ethics, rather than traditional moralities, tend to be more modest, more creative, and more relational, unquote. In other words, there are different relations around waste, but not in an absolute and obligatory sense. The meaning of waste is open-ended, but we are left to speculate about its multiple dimensions. It is known that plastics last about 100,000 years, which surpasses everyone's lifespan. Reducing the number of plastics through parts making and other forms of practice, including architecture, might be an imminent task to do. However, it is also instructive to note that Hawkins considers everyday waste, such as plastic, as a reminder of, quote, all the practices that bring us to the reality of possibilities of what remains, unquote. She points out that dumped waste is a problem to solve but the process is too quick to speculate of, speculate that both wasted things and ourselves are intricately related to each other. Instead of relying on determinate judgment, she proposes to make an effective relationship with waste. Carefully rinsing out plastic waste is one thing. We are always putting them apart, excuse me, we are always putting them to garbage cans as if it is a kind of ritual is another. An activity of sorting out and throwing waste is a dry and technical thing. But it is weird to, weird to realize that all those things which have been private part of one's life just a few minutes ago suddenly become public in the deceased forms. In this sense, it can be said that the area of garbage bins is like a tomb and an activity of throwing waste is like a funeral. However, a wasting activity does not need to be always solemn and serious. It could be also creative and enjoyable. This line of thought is made in, made in reference to Hawkins as she considers the Enjoy Your Garbage, which is the City Council of Brisbane campaign for 
promoting recycling culture in the city about 20 years ago to be a good example in causing to make an effective relationship with waste. It raised a well-known slogan, reuse, recycle, reduce in a different sense, thereby making no attempt to clearly separate waste from life. Waste is an undervalued media and it is the extension of man in reference to Marshall McLuhan. Then how can one resonate Harkin's conception of waste with architectural or urban complexity in an environmental sense? Given that it is a broad topic, I'd like to narrow it down with an example that wasted plastics are upcycled into an urban infrastructure, but its environmental message remains not capitalized. It is a public park called Dalpit Orini Gongwon, translated as the Moonlight Children's Park. So this is the example. So the park is a result of collaboration between Council Ministry of Seoul, as U Plus, which is a cell phone company and also a branch of conglomerate LG. And the last three, the TerraCycle, the consulting global company specialized for recycling on a global scale. What I find interesting is the way that its message remains invisible. In its appearance, the park is not so much different from similar kinds of play playground that one can find anywhere in the country. It is composed of two upright shelter structures for children's play, which are pen penetrated by horizontal pathways and a spiral tunnel down to the ground, which is finished with artificial green field absorbing bump. The park is located in the middle of residential area. There's no obvious sign showing that it is an environment friendly project. One can only identify the related information as two different parts within the site. So this is the detail. And uh, as, a, as the first one is a small board is installed on top of the playground structure on the right, on, on the left, excuse me. And it is marked with the symbols of three different agents being involved in the project. Another on the right is located in the corner as a freestanding billboard. It explains that this structure is the result of the collaboration and made by wasted cell phones. The sentences are written in a plain text and there is indeed an instructive message with the typical reuse, recycle and reduce icon on its right. However, the board is made small and located behind the scene so that its presence is, presence is more or less hidden. The park is not so much a visual, visually prominent figure against the ground, but instead a mixture of the two. Built in 2019, it is a pertinent environmental work but left behind people's attention for some reasons which might not have been intended. This kind of invisibility is also comparable to how Starbucks Korea, the famous coffee brand, collaborates with, collaborates with SKC, which is the chemistry branch on the another representative South Korean conglomerate called Sungyeong to produce packaging wrap, flatware, and container made of biodegradable plastics. There is, of course, a mark and the following sentence explain the collaboration, but it's likewise not prominent. The invisibility is presumably driven, derived from a more intricate system of advertisement through other means. Put it another way, one can say that both the park and the biodegradable plastics as Starbucks are like invisible monuments. According to Robert Muji, quote, Monuments are so conspicuously inconspicuous, unquote. He is attentive to the irony of monument that in as much as a certain monument aspires to make visible the presence through its elaborate form and symbolism, it denotes us. It is because monument is often experienced every day and kind of desensitized thereafter. This conception of monument does not mean that making things prominent always ends up being trapped by such an irony. It opens up the multiple affective relationships with a given monument, 
thereby this, this table raising the belief that an act might be conspicuous but remain inconspicuous by its person. It is a phenomenological speculation which pays attention to interactivity, but the kind of interactivity here includes all the wasted things on both conceptual and affective senses, which come across the subtle lines between life and death, death, solemnity and joyousness, and monumentality and everydayness. Then how would one this case be instructive to teaching pedagogy and also the issue of architectural complexity? About the latter question, I insist that experience or an exposure to everyday life constitutes the complexity of the infrastructure that I just showed uh, a couple of minutes ago. It is a public park with which the message of environment, environmentalism is inscribed. But what I find interesting is its inattentiveness, at least on an experiential level. The park has its own autonomy, that is to say, its own system of production and the set of agent agential relationships, all of which made it possible into material form. Its invisibility is possible, presumably because it was considered not so much a work of art, but rather an administrative service. However, might it not also be the case that an elaborate work of architecture is at times passed through without someone's attention. Peter Junto, who is the, the uh, Switzerland architect, makes a similar claim in his book, Atmospheres. Junto explains that he would be happy in as much as he, his own work becomes a kind of mere background for a young couple's kissing place. His speculation is also phenomenological and considers the strata of, of experience yet to come as part of architecture. Viewed in this respect, architect is one um, actor among many, just as visitors, critics, or others could be also another kind of actors in influencing to shape what is meant by architecture. This symmetrical way of seeing is not simply confined to the conception of architectural aesthetics, but extended to the kind of discourse that I aim to enact with my case. The issue of waste, as specified by plastic in my presentation, is definitely linked to the broader discourse known as the Anthropocene. It is perhaps too big to narrow it down and remains to extend into multiple directions. Just as architecture is a complex entity and also a virtual realm from which multiple strata could unfold, the same logic can be applied to the Anthropocene. Just as there is no predestined path to follow the discourse, one can presume certain predestined ways of doing with the impending issues of climate crisis. It is because speculating about both environment and waste involves the person speculating those issues. So the manner of speculation is not so much epistemological, but also ontological, in the sense that we, as an unidentified entity, are already thrown into the plastic world being speculated. What is needed is the ontology of waste, which eludes any simplified conceptions or morally driven agendas imposed from the outside. And this way of singing would make sense in exploring architectural complexity in both research and teaching situations. Thank you.